Hello. Can you see the desktop now? Sure thing. Okay, great. Let me get set up a little bit. Okay, um, now let me see. I put a note up on the website on Monday that there would be, we're gonna have this, an exam, like, like, the, like the syllabus said, the exam will be on, on the final exam day. And it's gonna be, like it says here, like an in-class take-home exam. Uh, you know, the ex I'll hand out the exam, probably using Blackboard. Uh, you'll write the ex your answers to the exam on paper and then you'll have to scan them in and set them back up uh, and, and submit them on blackboard so i, I know that, that some other you may have already taken exams like this i know some other professors are doing it this way so you know the the exam will be pretty much like an in-class exam you have a couple hours to do it and like i say it'll you know i'll hand it out by making it available on blackboard you'll you can download it or you can just read it off blackboard and then you could write your answers on a piece of paper and you'll scan them. And at the end of the time, you'll have to upload them back to Blackboard. So just like you upload homework assignments, you'll upload your, your, your uh, ex you'll have to scan your exam in somehow. That's the main, that's the main catch is you'll have to wait, have to be, you'll have to have a way to make a copy of your exam that you, so you can upload it. Okay. Um, and then these are review problems, just like before. These are problems that will be similar to what's going to be on the exam. It's mostly about uh, it's, there's a couple review. There's a couple problems about uh, the uh, multi-level feedback queue algorithm or well, scheduling algorithms. There's a, there's a couple problems about scheduling algorithms, and all the rest is about uh, virtual memory. Okay, and we'll look at we'll look at some of these examples. Um, we got we still have uh, next week is class. So we'll be looking at some of these problems next week. We'll go over some of them in class because they're good. These are actually pretty good problems for uh, reviewing the ideas that we've been talking about. Today, we're going to talk about this chapter, Beyond Physical Memory Mechanisms. So we're going to we'll talk about this chapter here today. Okay, And then if we have time, we'll also go back to the code that we we're looking at that lets us that's similar to your homework assignment code. And we'll look at some of the code examples that play with Windows virtual memory. Okay, so let's start with talking about this beyond physical memory. What, uh, okay, so here's the idea. We wanna introduce, okay, we've done demand paging. Here's a picture I drew. Actually, let me open that and paint. Okay, so here's a here's an example of two processes, virtual memory, virtual memory one with page table one, and virtual memory two with page table two sitting in physical memory. And the programs that are running in these virtual memory spaces came from the disk drive. So here was the code stack and heap pages. This is the exe file. This would be the exe file on the hard drive for this process. And this would be the exe file for this process. And then I'm, I'm, this is the, these are the sectors on the hard drive. Remember, a sector on the hard drive is the exact same size as a, a page in virtual memory. Then I've got uh, some data on the hard drive. And then I've got a section of the hard drive marked as swap. That's what we want to talk about today, this thing called the swap space. If you look on your computer, if you go to your C drive and you have Windows, go view options, change folder settings, view. I can't, there's, there's two, Think high. See, there's a uh, show hidden folders. And then there's also this one, hide protected operating system files. I'm not sure which one of them shows the one. Look. So I'll do one of them. I'll, so I'll click on show hidden folders and drives. Okay, yeah, that wasn't the one. So let me try the other one then. So view 
options, change folder options, view. Okay, that wasn't the one I wanted. I think it's, it's it makes sense. It's uh, high protected operating systems file. We want to we want to see that swap file on our computer, at least on this computer. So I click OK, and oh, do I have to do both of them? Let me try again. Okay, I guess you have, maybe you have to switch, you have to turn off both of those. There it is. And then there's also, yeah, Windows has actually got, uh, they got a fun, something called swap file and page file, okay? They didn't used to have both of these. I'm not even sure why they have both now. They have page, because sometimes this thing that we're gonna show in this picture is called the swap space and sometimes it's called the, pa the page space. Usually it's called the swap space, okay? So here in Windows, you can see what we're talking, this is where that file is in Windows. It's on your C drive. Notice that this is a really big file, seven gigabytes. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the swap space. You can see it's seven gigabytes. I don't, I'm not sure what this guy is here. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what this guy is here. It's not very big, 16 megabytes. Maybe it's some extra data about, the, about what's in here. I don't remember that one even being there before, but that is the swap space. Okay, it's, it's this computer has is a, not quite eight gigabytes of swap space. So we're going to talk about what that file is doing on the hard drive and what the a modern operating system does with it. Okay. Okay. Let me turn off that showing. It gets confusing when you have these hidden files shown. So I'm going to, if unless you really want to see them, if you don't, it, it's you know, every once in a while it's worth turning this off to see them. But they are confusing because they, they, there's a whole lot of files start appearing on your hard drive. Okay, so I turned off all the hidden files now. Okay, all right, so we want to talk about what we're going to do with this thing here. Now, I've got two processes. I've, I've, you know, I'm drawing an example with small amounts of memory. So a virtual memory space is six pages. And the physical memory space is also just six pages. Okay, and I've got two processes loaded. Uh, code stack and heap, code stack and heap, just to give an example of three possible pages. I've got the page table set up, okay? I've got it so that uh, these, are the th you know, these are the three virtual pages that he has allocated, one, two, and three, and his code is over here. So it's in page frame one, and his stack is over here in page frame two, but his heap is over down here in page frame five. So there's his page frame number. His, his page one is in page frame one, his page two is in page frame two, his page three is in page frame five. And these are valid page references. These others are invalid. Now I, I draw them blank here, but remember there are no computer memory locations ever blank. There's a number in there. It may be the number that was left there by the last process that used this page table. But the fact that this bit is zero means you ignore whatever's in there. So remember, it does. I you know, we for convenience we draw the picture as if it was blank, but memory is never ever blank. So this bit tells you don't read that memory. If there was, if this memory could truly be written, made blank, you wouldn't need this bit because blank would mean unused. But there's no such thing as an unusable value. Every possible value in there could be could be a valid value. So you need a flag to say that it is invalid. So th those the, the ones that are blank are marked invalid. These are valid. And these have been allocated, so they're present. Okay, so I've actually allocated them, so they're present. Same with over here. You know, he, this guy, his code is there, his stack is there, his heap is there. So there's his page table entries. His heap is over here. His stack is over here. Okay, All right. so now, Remember, this page was copied from here on the hard drive. When this program ran, this page, well, when the program ran, this page table was set up with these as valid and these as invalid. Remember, so that's the demand paging part. 
We're gonna, we're gonna modify the demand paging part a little bit. And we've gone through those steps a couple of times, but when this guy first ran, when he was uh, first initialized, his, his, these pages would be valid, but these pages would be not present. It wasn't until the program started running and it first touched its code that this thing had, since this would have been invalid, the operating system had to go over here, grab this data, copy it somewhere in an empty page frame, then mark it as present and which page frame it's present in. And then when the program touched its stack, again, it would see that this was invalid. So that would mean that the, you had to have a page fault. The operating system would have to go back here, get this, copy it into a page frame, then mark that page that page is which page frame it's in and it mark it as valid. Okay. So the same thing would be true with both of these. So this is this is what memory looks like after these programs have been running and have been loaded into physical memory. Okay. Now remember we said that a program could ask for more memory. This is part of the demand paging idea that a program could say, uh, suppose this program wants to load one of these data pages. Okay. So I suppose this program requested from the operating system that it take this page and make it that data page, okay? So um, actually, let me make it, I wanna make this data one and make this one over here, data two, okay? So there's two different data. So, so he's gonna load, this guy requests, that data one be in page four, okay? When he makes that request, the operating system will say, okay, your page four, your page four now is valid. So page four is valid, okay? but it's still not present because maybe this program, it, you know, it's requested this data, but it hasn't touched it yet. So the operating system go ahead and says, okay, that's a valid page of memory. You're allowed to touch it. When you touch it, your program's not gonna blow up. If you touch this page, your program blows up because it's invalid. If you touch this page, your program blows up because it's invalid. But now this page is valid, but it's still not present, okay? Okay, now here's where the interesting comes in. What happens when he touches this page? Okay, so when he touches this page, the operating system sees the, that, the, well, the CPU sees that it's invalid. So the CPU tells the operating system, you need to allocate something here. The CPU can't do the allocation. The CPU notices that, the, that this bit is uh, zero. So it, know, it knows that this is not, it's not, it, oh, Remember, the difference between this and this are two different kinds of interrupts. I mean, this is the invalid interrupt will halt the CPU. This present, not present interrupt will tell the CPU to go to the operating system and get a page for it. Okay, so in this case, you know, if, if a program touches this page because it's invalid, the CPU will be told to shut the program down. In our case now, if the pay, if program touches this page, it's valid, so the program isn't being shut down, but it's not present, so the operating system is being told to load a page. Now we go over here, and there's nothing free. Okay, there's nothing free. So what the operating system is going to do is it's going to evict some page of memory back out to the hard drive. It's going to evict a page of memory back out to the hard drive, okay, to make space over here. Now, here's what's okay. Suppose he decides to evict this guy here, the heap of this other process. So he's going to evict that. You don't want to evict him to where he came from because this is his exe file, and you don't want to modify the exe file because how would you ever get it back to where it was when the program is supposed to start? You know, this program has been running and it's been modifying this. So this has been changed while the program was running. So when you're gonna evict him, you should evict him to a space in the swap file. That's what the swap file is there for. 
the swap file is for evicting things out of physical memory to make room for new things to be allocated in somebody's virtual memory. Okay, so here's what we'll do: we'll we'll take this heap, we'll evict him from there, and we'll put him in one of the swap spaces. So maybe I, and it doesn't really matter where, I'll put him over here. So he's the blue heap. Okay. He got evicted to there, okay? Now when he got evicted to there, he's no longer present, okay? So you've gotta go over here and this one here, this one is not present anymore, okay? So we have to mark this one as not present. So this is part of the, the you know, we're trying to make room for this guy over here and we have, the operating system has to do a lot of work. Now it's got to mark this one now as not present, okay? Now, there is a little bit more that has to be done. When you mark this guy as not present, there in somewhere, in, and actually the textbook doesn't even explain how this is done. Somewhere, maybe in the, uh, the process control block, there has to be a record kept of where he got put, okay? Yeah, he's, he's put somewhere in the swap space, okay? So you can't lose track of where he is. Now the page table's not the thing that keeps track of where he got swapped to. Okay, and our textbook doesn't even say quite how operating systems keep track of where things got swapped to. But the idea is that now, since he's no longer present, the, the, there's an entry somewhere made to say he's not present in physical memory, he's actually in the swap space, okay? That might be a di another bit. For example, it could be another bit over here that says not present, but in the swap space, okay? So uh, our operating system, our textbook kind of leads a little bit ambiguous about how you denote where in the swap space something is when it's not present, okay? All right, so now there's an empty page over here. So now that page can be out, that page frame can be allocated to this process. So now this process over here can say, okay, now this one's going to be present, This one's gonna be present. And it's present in page three. Okay, so now page three over here holds data one. Okay. Okay, all right. So, we now have one page frame swapped out into the mass storage device, okay? Now, what we've done now, the key idea is we've now let these two programs pretend that there's more memory than there is over here. Now, the amount of physical memory turns out to be actually the amount of physical memory you have plus the amount of swap space you have. So right now, I've got it so that there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 pages of physical memory. And what they amount to is there's some fast pages of physical memory and some slow pages of physical memory. Now, here's a weird fact that you're gonna run up against this a lot. This, you know, okay, I have two kinds of, in a sense, physical memory. There's the physical memory that's actually physical memory. And then there's the kind of memory that's off in the swap space. I'm gonna be treating it like it fills physical memory, but every time I wanna use it, I have to copy it into physical memory. I have to swap it in and before I can actually use it. This memory over here that's acting like physical memory is often called virtual memory, okay? You will see this all the time. If you Google the phrase virtual memory, you'll actually most of the time see people refer to this swap space as the virtual memory. That's not the way people in operating systems use the word. In real operating systems speak, virtual memory is this virtual address space. This is virtual memory. And it's, this is an important distinction uh, because it, it's, it's, it's 
it's it's the terminology is used by most of the people the word virtual memory is used by most of the people to mean the swap space and it's used by operating system people to mean exclusively this at this form of virtual memory using page tables okay for example you'll hear people say that you can turn off virtual memory in windows okay if you go over here remember we showed that there was that swap file that was that swap file over here i'm going to show it again okay you can go over here and show the swap space There's a way to tell Windows to delete this swap space and never, then don't use this virtual, don't use swap space. You can tell Windows not to use the swap space so that if you run out of physical pages, you run out of memory. With the swap space, if you run out of physical page frames, you can just start using, you can copy something from here over to here and then free up a page frame. But if you turn off the page, the uh, page file you can't do that people refer to that as turning off virtual memory okay and i think you know you can probably google the phrase turn off windows virtual memory okay and you can even see from the advanced tab click let's see i think i remember how to do this Oh, okay, it's gonna ask me to, it won't even let me see. I, unless I log in, it won't let me see the, but you can go to a, you can you can go and turn off virtual memory. But no, no, this person actually put in a little parentheses. What you're really turning off is the paging file. You cannot turn off what we call virtual memory. The, the page tables and the virtual memory system are hard code they're they're part of the cpu they can never be turned off you know windows never turns off the use of page tables and page frames and you know virtual memory page tables and page frames that's never ever ever turned off what you can turn off is a swap space you can just say that i have so much physical memory i don't want you to ever use a swap space and some people do do that but it's erroneously referred to as turning off virtual memory, okay? And you can, you'll, find, you'll find tons of this kind of stuff. And if, if someone asks on, on one of these forums, what is virtual memory? A lot of times the answer they'll get is, there's a file on your hard drive, that's virtual memory, which is not right. The file on your hard drive is the swap space. It's, but it's being used as a substitute for physical page frames. You know, a, phys a physical page frame can be copied out here temporarily, freeing up a page frame. And then when it's needed, we'll see that it's gonna get copied back in. We haven't done that step, but at some point, if this heap is needed, it needs to be copied back into physical memory. You, you never read these pages. You never read and write directly from these pages here. The swap space, the CPU never really sees them. It doesn't read and write from them. The only way the CPU can update that heap is that heap has to be, what we say, swapped back in somewhere, okay? All right, so now we've got essentially one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages of physical memory, but only six page frames, okay? Now let's do, let's do one more example. Uh, suppose, he, suppose he also asks for data too. So suppose this guy over here, also wants the uh, data to page. So he asks for data to, okay? So at that point, the operating system says, okay, that page frame now is, oh, I'm sorry, okay, that page frame is now valid, whoops, wrong color. That page frame is now valid, but it's still, we should say, it's still not present, okay? 
So at first, somebody, this program tells the operating system using, if it's a Windows program, it would do this using virtual alloc, which like we've seen a little bit of the code we've been playing with. The, this process would call virtual alloc, pointing at the address of that page and saying, I want that page to be in use and I want it to be, and, and we actually haven't seen, we've only seen how to allocate the page. We haven't seen how to allocate the page with a file saying, I want that data in that page. And uh, we're not gonna do that. Windows has, a, Windows has the ability to say, not only did I wanna allocate that page, but I wanna allocate the page with data from the hard drive, okay? So right now this program, so first the, pro, the, the, um, the process allocates the page so the operating system is going to allocate the page from, and then it'll be up to the, in this case, we can imagine that the process is going to have to open the file, then copy the file into the page. I mean, that's actually one way that this program can get that data in that page. He could allocate the page, okay? And then the operating system wouldn't know that it's for that, pa that data. The operating system would just give him a blank page frame, and then he could open the file and copy the file into the page. But it also is the case that Windows actually knows how to allocate a page directly from the hard drive. So you can do it either way in Windows. You can allocate an empty page frame, open the file, copy the file's data into the empty page frame, or you could actually have Windows allocate that piece of the hard drive to your, over here. Now, when this program tries to touch that data, maybe to copy the data in, the operating system is gonna say, well, that, pa that page frame is that page is not present yet. So it's gotta go over here and it's gotta kick somebody else out of memory, okay? So right now, let's suppose that uh, virtual process memory, virtual uh, process two is the one that's gonna be keep being attacked. So let's suppose that the operating system decides that we're gonna evict this, okay? So let's evict him, say, over to, that's the blue code page. Let's evict him to here. So he got evicted to here. Now that was this page. So this page is now marked as no longer present. It's been evicted. It's no longer present. Now this, is, this brings up a good point. Notice that this four doesn't mean anything anymore. He used to be in four. He's over here in the swap space now. That, pres that bit, present bit being zero means that that piece of data is meaningless. Same thing was true over here. That zero here meant that that number doesn't really mean anything. That number doesn't get erased. It just gets left there. This says that number is meaningless. Later on, that page that was there is gonna to have to be copied back into physical memory. We'll see that it could end up almost anywhere. Okay, so right now, he's looking at two of his pages having been evicted to the swap space while he's basically taking over physical memory. You know, he's running and he's taking over physical memory. So now we have to, now this page here that got evicted, we're gonna allocate it to him. So. I'm going to put data two here. Okay, so this will be data two. And I go over to here and I've now allocated his fifth page to the page frame number four. So I can go over here. Whoops, what happened there? I can go over here and update his page table. Yeah, I now update his page table to say that he's in, this page is mapped to page frame four, and that means it's now present. So now I can say that that page is, now I can mark that page as present. Okay, so he's using now one, two, three, four, five pages of physical memory. He's using one, two, three, four, five of the pages of physical memory. And this process has only got one page, okay? Now we're, we're assuming at this point that this process is not running on the CPU. That's why the, the operating system is taking away pages from him. Because we're assuming that this one's not running on the CPU, that it's this one that's running on the CPU. 
now let's suppose we switch over to this guy running so so this guy loses the cpu now this guy takes over well he starts you know when he comes back he's running and immediately as soon as he starts running he immediately you know he starts running his code page is page two and the uh, cpu says wait a minute this thing's not valid i'm sorry not present so you get a page fault right away so this guy's gonna have to page fault his code back in okay but everything is filled over here so what do you need th the thing to do now is you would have to swap somebody out okay so let's go ahead and let's swap out data one, okay? Now, when we swap out data one, we can't put them back here because maybe he's been updated and you don't wanna change that data on the hard drive because that would be up to this program to write the data to the hard drive. Right now, the pro from this program's point of view, his data is in memory and he hasn't written it to the hard drive. He hasn't updated the file on the hard drive. From his point of view, the data on the hard drive is not the same as the data in memory. So when this guy gets swapped out, he should swap out to someplace in the swap space. Okay. So what we're going to do is he will he will will swap out data one. Okay. And we'll put him in the swap space, say over here. So that's data one. Now data one, now notice this data one is not a copy of this data one because this data one was brought into memory and this process could have updated it. So this data one that was pulled from here into here does not have to be the exactly same thing as this thing here. Maybe this process will later on write that data back out to the hard drive, but that's up to the process to do that. The virtual memory system cannot assume that this data two is a copy of that data two, or this data one was still a copy of this data one. It has to assume that this was updated. Okay, so then it would write it over to here. All right, so now this page is free. Okay, so now this blue code can be pulled back into here. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna deallocate the code page from the swap space. We're gonna, it's gonna be, it's not, it's gonna just say, well, we're gonna cop, we're gonna deallocate it from the swap space and put it in memory over here. So now here's the blue code page. Okay. So now that page is going to be, ah, now see that we have to update the page frame entry. That page frame entry goes, it used to be in four, now it's valid in now it's valid in three and we go over here oh, oh i'm sorry did i put it in the wrong place yeah it's two it's this one's the code page it's now in three and we have to point out that it's now present okay now it's present in okay so now this process got one of his pages swapped out. This process got his code page swapped back in. Notice it's in a different place than it used to be. It got swapped into, it used to be in page four, now it's in page three. Okay, all right. So this is how, what we call swapping or what modern virtual, there's really not a good name for this. Uh, we have simple paging, demand paging, and you might call this swap paging. Sim okay, let's quick go over the three kinds of paging. We first introduced simple paging. The difference was there was no, uh, well, in, this, in that case, when a program ran, all its pages were allocated immediately. All the pages were allocated immediately. Okay, that's simple paging. If there's not enough empty space in the heart, uh, in physical memory to allocate a process, the process doesn't run, it crashes, okay? So in simple paging, when you run a program, all its pages get allocated immediately, okay? So there is no present bit. So in simple paging, there's no present bit because it's taken for granted that everything that's valid is automatically present, okay? Then demand paging adds the present bit, okay? In demand paging, 
when a program is loaded, you just mark it as valid but not present, and you don't copy pages into page frames until they're actually needed. That saves you from copying pages that never get used. So if a program's got lots of code pages that are only called in an emergency, there's no need to really have them in memory until that emergency, if it ever happens. So with demand paging, you have a present bit, okay? but you still have the problem that when you need to copy a page into physical memory, there's gotta be an empty page frame. With demand paging, the assumption was if there's no empty page frame, when you demand a page, your program crashes with an out of memory error message, okay? So that's demand paging. The, the loading is lazy, the loading is on demand, but the loading assumes that there's gonna be an empty space over here. If there's no empty space over here, the program crashes. Now with the swap paging, which that's not a term that anybody uses, uh, I don't think people have really come up with a good name for this third kind of paging, which is really what all operating systems use. They use this swap paging. With swap paging, you have this special area on the hard drive dedicated to the virtual memory system, okay? It acts like demand paging, but the, the extra step is that if there's no space over here for a page that's demanded to be brought in, you can kick out some page from physical memory to the swap space and free up a space in physical memory, okay? So you can free up spaces in physical memory by sending things out to the swap space. You can potentially actually have the swap space fill up too. You, you could have so many programs re requesting so much memory that you could fill up physical memory in a swap space, then your program crashes on an out of memory error. Okay, uh, it, 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 there's no reason why you can't, you could do this with it. You could write a program that just keeps asking for more pages and more pages. You could write a program that just keep, that just asks for, uh, for example, uh, on my computer, I have 16 gigabytes of memory. And we saw that the swap space is another about eight gigabytes. Okay, so I've got I've got sixteen gigabytes of physical memory, and what some people call eight gigabytes of virtual memory. But a better way to say is I have eight gigabytes of swap space, so I have twenty-four gigabytes of allocatable memory. If I write a program that tries to allocate thirty gigabytes of memory, at some point it's going to fill up all the physical memory, fill up all of the swap space, and it'll run out of memory and it'll crash. Okay, so I have a, I actually have, a, when this, this operating system right now has the potential to allocate at most um, 24, 24 gigabytes of memory. Okay, the, the amount of physical memory plus whatever amount of swap space I have allocated. If that were to actually happen to me a couple of times, I can have Windows increase the size of this swap space, but that requires rebooting the computer. That's something you do, you, you, this swap space is put on the hard drive when you boot the computer. So you, if you want to change its size, you have to reboot the computer. You can't just, at least not with, not that I know of, at least in Windows, it can't change the size of that space while the operating system's running. It didn't used to be able to, and I don't think that's ever been, that's, I don't think that's a feature the operating system has. I'm pretty sure that if you want to change that size of that page file, if you want to change the swap space to make it bigger, you have to do something, you have to change the configuration of the operating system and reboot it, okay? All right, so now that's my, my virtual memory system is now the combination of my physical memory and the swap space, okay? So you can run out of physical, remember with demand paging, you ran out of memory when the physical memory was filled. With swap paging, you run out of memory when the physical memory is full and the swap space is full. If both of them are full, then you're, then you're out of luck, then your program crashes, okay? Now, this is the mechanism. In the textbook, we have two chapters on this. We just talked about the physical memory beyond. See, he, he gives it a funny name. He calls it beyond physical memory. 
Okay, and he actually doesn't, I don't think he ever comes up with a good name for this. It, um, it's demand paging with a swap space. Okay. I don't remember if he uses that. See, he doesn't even. Yeah, he doesn't use that phrase. Uh, there isn't really a, a well established name for this kind of memory system. Most people just refer to it as virtual memory. This. Or, or paging. When people talk, in operating system people, when they talk about paging, they mean this page virtual memory system with a swap space. Demand paging with a swap space. But when you're learning it, it's worth learning it in stages and learning simple paging first, where you have to allocate everything at the, when the program is loaded, to demand paging, where you can allocate things in a lazy form, but you have to have free. You have to you assume that you can't allocate pages unless they're uh, there's they're free. To the swap demand, the swapping demand paging when you do lazy loading, and if this area, if the physical memory is full, you can swap out something from physical memory to make room for bringing something into physical memory for allocating a new page frame. Okay, so this is the mechanism adding this hard drive. There are a whole lot of policies. I've kind of skipped over a whole little, a bunch of details here. So for example, when this guy allocated these two pages and somebody had to give up a page, who gets to decide who loses a page in the page frame? Who loses a page frame? Who gets to decide who loses a page frame? Now it's the operating system that gets to decide but the operating system should have policies about this. Like we'll see one possibility. There's, for example, when it's time to kick somebody out of physical memory, there's two broad policies. One broad policy is that whatever process is running has to give up one of its own page frames to make room for a new page frame. So if this program has three page frames and he asks for a fourth page frame, one policy would be that one of his three page frames has to be swapped out for him to get room for a new page frame. Okay, so that's one policy. Another policy is that when he needs a new page frame, the operating system can choose to swap out any page it wants, whether it's one of his pages or somebody else's pages. That's a different policy. So these policies, we're going to, we'll spend, there's a whole chapter on the policies that, that determine the different rules for who decides and how this, they decide to manage the uh, physical pages. So it's going to be called page replacement policies. We're going to be talking about, we're well, not today, but we'll talk about these page replacement policies. How do you decide who to kick out? Somebody has to be kicked out. Now, what's interesting is this idea of who to kick out is actually a really broad computer science issue. It falls under what computer scientists refer to as cache management. Okay, It's something referred to as cache management, which is a really big issue in modern computer. It's, it's an, actually, it's a part of database theory it's part of virtual memory. It's part of the CPU because everybody has caches. So uh, what we're, what it turns out that this physical memory becomes a cache of pages. You know, we don't we don't necessarily think of it that way, but you could point, think of it as this is a cache of pages. Databases have caches for uh, data. Hard drives have caches for data. The CPU has caches for data. You know, everywhere you look in, in in computer science, there are caches. So we're going to be we're going to talk about the page replacement policy over here, and then we'll see we'll see that it's actually a special case of a very broad idea in computer science of cache management. Okay. Now, oops. Let me see if there. 
So for a mechanism, that's pretty much all there is because we've already talked about demand paging. So the new, the, yeah, I'll call it swap paging or demand swap paging because there's both the demand aspect and the swapping aspect of it. The, the new, when you go from demand paging to demand swap, oh, remember in demand paging, you still have the hard drive. You have the hard drive because that's where the codes, that's where everything comes from originally. Yeah. So in demand paging, you have the hard drive, but you don't have the swap space. There's not this space where you could take something from here, put it over here and keep a copy of it for a while until it becomes later on, comes back into memory. Okay. So there is no swap space for demand paging. Okay. In a demand paging system, this program could run like this, but he would have to say that he wants that, 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 and that initially. So at, at, when the program, uh, well, actually, um, if, you, if you, in a demand page system, suppose this program really wanted five pages, okay? It could, this, okay, think, let's go back and kind of go back to, uh, to the starting point and think about this. Suppose this program ran first and loaded his three pages in memory. So he, he, he has three pages in memory. So he's, it, it will go back to demand paging, no swap space. He runs and he, pick, he picks off three pages in memory. Then he runs. Well, when he runs, he needs these pages right away. So he gets them. But then when he asks for data one, he crashes because this guy will have allocated three pages and this guy will have allocated three pages and there's only six pages. So if we were doing pure demand paging, he would crash. But on the other hand, suppose we went back to the beginning and started with this process first. Suppose you ran this process first. You would allocate this page, this page, this page, this page, this page. So this guy would get his five pages because if you started him first, there's, you would start with six empty pages over here. So he would take five of them. Then this guy would start up, he would get his code page, and then as soon as he tried to touch his stack, there would be nothing left over here, and then he would crash. So notice that if you, with demand paging and no swap space, whether a program crashes or not depends a lot on who gets run first and who gets things allocated first. So I mean, that's one reason why we don't use demand paging anymore, because it, uh, there's no real reason why you should crash a program when there's lots of empty space on the hard drive. So you, you know, with the, the with the swap demand paging, when a program comes up and you know if this program starts up and grabs five of the page frames, okay, he's running with five page frames in physical memory. Then he wants to run. He only needs three page frames. Why not free up some of these into the swap space, okay, so that this guy can run? Now the only dis one big disadvantage of this is it slows programs down. If he comes in and kicks two of his pages out of physical memory. When it goes back time for his turn to run, he now has to do, if he got these two pages kicked out of memory into the swap space, he has to do two disk operations to bring them back in. Because when he touches this page, it'll, it'll page fault because it'll no longer be present. Then when he touches this page, it'll page fault because it's no longer present. So the demand swap paging has the potential, this is actually called thrashing. What you could end up having, suppose this program needed uh, five pages, and this program actually needed five pages, but there's only six pages over here. You would have a situation where when this program was running, it would take up five of these pages. So only one page would be left to him. Okay. Then when you switched over to him and he start running, he needs five pages, but he only has one over here. So he has to copy four of his pages out of the swap space back into physical memory. Then he runs for a while. Then you switch over to him. Well, at this point, he has five pages in physical memory. So he's only gonna have one page left in physical memory. So he now needs to copy five of his pages, four of his pages back into physical memory. And as you switch between these two processes back and forth, each one has to start off by copying himself back into physical memory. That's called thrashing. Each program now is being slowed down by quite a bit because every time he wants to run, he has to cop. This is why you want a lot of physical memory 
This is what slows, you know, if you buy a laptop with only two gigabytes of physical memory, you will have these kind of things happen. Um, you will get programs that are fighting for physical memory. Uh, like right now, Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I haven't loaded much into Chrome. Chrome can be a real memory hog. Let me load some big pages. Newspapers right now seem to be some of the bigger pages. Um, what did I type? I typed something wrong. Okay, let me even open another one. Let's see. Just open another one to the New York Times. Okay, All right. Notice that my memory usage went up a little bit. And if I kept loading pages, Chrome would start using, you can get Chrome to use up easily a gigabyte or two of memory itself. Like, now, since Chrome is in pieces, you have to add up, see, this is how much memory Chrome has, okay? And you have to add up all these, but you can get these to add up to a couple gigabytes, okay? So if you have only a two gigabyte, suppose you only have two gigabytes of physical memory, like on a really inexpensive laptop, Chrome could take over almost all of it, okay? So then you could end up with programs fighting with Chrome for the physical page frames, so programs are being constantly copied out to the swap space, copied back into physical memory, and you would get lots of, you would see that you would be starting to get lots of page faults. So you, would, you could look at the page fault delta column and, and see actually right now, for what, what's odd about this Windows is notice it's page faulting like crazy, right? You know, there's some programs that are page faulting a lot. Windows actually does page faulting even when there's empty physical page frames. Like I'm probably nowhere near using all of the physical memory of this computer right now. Like this computer has 16 gigabytes of, of, of well, actually you can look over here. The computer has 16 gigabytes of physical memory. I'm only using half of it, okay? So that means from our point of view, half of these page frames are empty. Why in the world would you ever be page faulting something if half of these are empty? You know, but Windows actually does page fault quite a bit. And I've never seen a good explanation of why it thinks it should be page faulting when there's actually empty page frames in physical memory, okay? But you'll, you'll see that it's page faulting quite a bit, okay? Now, some of those page faults are Zoom. And, and that's, what, that's because Zoom is cycling data in and out of memory as it's streaming video. It's, uh, Zoom is actually, it's not Windows, this page faulting is actually being done by Zoom itself. What Zoom itself is doing is it's, if we think of it from our, this point of view, these, this would be where the video is being streamed into. So here's how it would work. Video is streaming into a frame, and when it fills up, it'll write it out to the hard drive, and then it'll start filling up another one over here and write it out to the hard drive, and then it'll maybe allocate another page, it'll, it'll allocate page frames to get more data into them, and then it'll write them to the hard drive, but it'll keep allocating new page frames for the new data. So as, in a sense, it streams down uh, virtual memory. So it will be, those page faults will be caused by the Zoom program constantly allocating new pages for it to copy new uh, data from the video stream. So those page faults would be caused by the, would be the choice of the program. That would be Zoom choosing the page, uh, page fault. But then there are other programs like, like I can see that Chrome is doing some page faulting. I mean, I'm not sure why Chrome would be doing any page faulting. You know, it's not, it's right now, it's, it's kind of st steady. There's not much happening. I'm not updating any tabs or anything. Well, but on your hand, it might have to do with the fact that there is some, these pages may be causing the page faults because they constantly keep 
doing weird things like they're loading little videos and stuff like that. So it might be like Zoom that that Chrome is having to act a little bit like Zoom is constantly needing to stream in video into little windows. OK. OK. So you see a lot of page faulting activity going on. And even and but the thing is, there is an arc in this case, there's lots of empty page frames. But there's still a fair amount of page faulting hap happening. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, we ran out of time, right? Or let's see. No, I'm sorry. What? What? How much time do we have left? Uh, a little over 15 minutes, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I I was looking at the wrong. I, I I I my eyes moved over to the wrong clock, and I got I, I got mixed up. Okay. So we got about 15 minutes. Okay, let's go look at, um, let's see. Um, Let's look at some of these programs. Just look at the, uh, let's see. Uh, we did loop through pages. Oh, memory loop. Okay, let's look at memory loop. This program is a fairly simple program. It, it's an, an infinite loop that allocates a page. Remember, you first have to reserve before you actually, we, it's the same function allocate, but Microsoft makes you reserve before you really allocate. Here's the real allocation. So this is gonna reserve a, a, some memory, then actually allocate the memory, okay? And then it's going to, okay, now what it does is it, it does the reserve and it sleeps. Then it does the allocation, then it sleeps. Okay. And then it, uh, then it frees it, then it sleeps. And then it de, well, when it frees it, this is decommitting. Okay. Um, if we go back to our picture over here, reserving is just saying, that this region of virtual memory should be marked as po potentially usable, but it's not, and it's, it has no, it doesn't touch the page table. Okay. So when you reserve, you're essentially letting Microsoft, the windows know that s some pages are going to be used, but does, there's nothing put in the page table. When you commit, that's when it becomes valid in the page table. When you commit it, it becomes valid, but not present. Okay. Okay. Now, to make it present, you'd have to uh, touch the page. So this one is actually going to touch the page by by taking an address in the page and deallocate, taking a pointer into the page and deallocating it. Okay. So that would touch it. Then decommit is to mark it back as. In, oh, when you touch it, it becomes valid and present. Then when you decommit it, you mark it as no longer valid. Okay, and then it'll also be no longer present also. So you're freeing up the page. You're marking it as no longer valid. But you still have to tell Windows that you're no longer interested in that region of virtual memory, so you have to unreserve it. So you free with release, you're unreleased, you're releasing it, okay? So that has nothing to do with the page table. That's just something that, that's just the step that Microsoft makes you do. So you tell the Windows operating system that you want to reserve. That just tells the operating system that there's a region of, of virtual memory you're interested in. Then you actually commit part of that reserved area. That marks it as valid. Then you might touch those pages. They, that marks them as present. When they're marked as present, then that's when the operating system has to go out and find a page frame for them. Then you can free up the, the virtual memory. 
that's telling Microsoft, the operating system, that you can, it can mark those pages as invalid. And they'll also, at that point, be also marked as not present. Mark them as invalid and not present. And then you, you free up, then you uh, release the memory, which tells Windows that you're no longer even interested in that region of virtual memory. Okay. Now, this program does that in a loop. And what we can, there's a couple ways we can use this program. One way is to, okay, the name of the program is Memory Loop. Okay, I can just run it. Okay, so it's running. I can look for it in Task Manager. Let's see, put these in alphabetical order. Where is it? Am I not? What happened? Is it run? It's running, isn't it? Oh, I thought that. Wait a minute. What happened? I thought it was an infinite loop. Did I did I miss something? Unless um. Okay. You know when programs do this, and they die on you kind of mysteriously. It's better to run them in a command line because there's there might be an error message that's disappearing. So I'm not sure why that program is dying. So let me run it in a command line. Oh, I prob okay. What happened? I haven't run this program in a while. Probably in the current version of Windows, the memory address I picked was a bad one. I picked a what I thought was a reasonable memory address. Remember, if, if, in the homework assignment, if you looked at the homework assignment, I, it points out that there's a big, huge, empty area of virtual memory in, in, in a Windows program. This is actually you know, four, this is two gigabytes of memory over here. Okay, it's a third, we're using 32-bit version of Windows. We're sticking to the 32-bit version of Windows to make things easier. So this is a four gigabyte virtual address space, but only half of it is usable in user space. So it's a two gigabyte address space. That means that most of it's gonna be empty. And what Microsoft tends to do is allocate a little bit of space for your program at the, t at the beginning of the virtual memory space and a little bit at the end of the virtual memory space and leave a huge empty hole in the middle. Okay, so I didn't aim very well for that empty hole in the middle. Okay, I probably uh, when I wrote this program, that empty that uh, either there was an empty space at this one address or it was um, inside the big empty hole. So what I have to do is I have to pick a different address. See, I hard coded the address in here. Um, let me see. Let's just okay, and let me get the. I have to compile it. I have to recompile it now. So there's the shortcut to the compiler. We're just copying. So let me compile it. Okay, let's see if it prefers that address. See if I got lucky and hit a Okay, looks like I got lucky and I hit an empty space of, of virtual memory. Okay, so now this program, oh, hmm.
oh, you can you you can see I, I learned a lesson. I did something real sloppy in this program. Anyone want to see what you know, what did I do that was lazy and sloppy in this program? Think about it. Look at what I've got here. You should be able to see it. I did something kind of dumb that it was really bad idea, and now I'm paying a price for it. Anybody got a sense of what I did wrong with this? What happened when I changed that number there? You typecasted the uh, LP void. No, that's not the stupid thing I did. Okay, what 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 did I do stupid? I cha I needed to change that number. A good little exercise. What it, you know, if, if you if, if if I showed this to a professional programmer, they'd groan and say, "What you know, this is really stupid of you, and why are you programming like this? What did I do wrong?" What do people mean by magic numbers? It's like um when you just have the number straight in there and you're not yeah what's you wrong can't with tell it? what it is well no worse than that what's wrong with it uh like if a, if something were to change or somebody tried to run it on a different machine it might not work for them no yeah. no 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 look i just changed that from, I, I added an extra zero to that number that's the address i'm allocating at but then i have that's reserving it then that's committing it so if i change this number what do i have to do Ah, uh, you got to change all the other numbers. Right. Yes. That that's a magic number. A number, if you change it one place, has to be magically changed ev a whole bunch of other places. Never use magic numbers. What should I be doing? It should be its own variable. Yeah, it should be its own variable. It should have a name. Yeah, you know, I should have said something like. Yeah, you know, I should have defined a name for it. So there should be. Define, say, uh, address, and then I could use that number there. Okay. okay. Then I should just use the name. Okay. It was used there, and it was used there and it was you see i have to, i have to make sure i keep those all in sync okay now here i got a little bit of a problem this was address plus four so i think i can just do address plus four okay all right and Now, let's see, did I use it anywhere else? I think those are the only places I used it. Okay, let's see if that fixed. Let's see if this is any better over here now. It's got those sleeps in it. So if, if it's crashing, I won't know until it's got past all the sleeps. Yeah, if there is a mistake still, I have to wait long enough for it to cycle through all the sleeps and then loop again. Okay, now, here is it running, okay. You can see that it's not, it's not gonna page fault anymore because it's been loaded into memory and it's cycling through. But remember, I could take, I can trim it. If I wanna see a page fault again, I can go over here and run this other program, the program that trims pages, okay? So I can go over here and, because, uh, let's see if I trim, let's see, I have to, um, Open another window. 
I want to trim process 17132. Okay, so there's my process. No, almost, we'll see what I, I forgot. What did I call it? Trim pages, I'm sorry, not trim, trim pages. You see, it, it page faults every once in a while. See, there's a page fault. Okay. Actually, I take it back. That that page faults for a different reason. Okay. Um, the program is allocating and deallocating memory. Okay. So another thing we can do is we can watch this program's virtual memory space and see it growing and shrinking. Okay. So let's look at let's watch this program from a different point of view. Let's watch this program by. Um, find the folder let's watch it with this VM map program okay so let's map this program's virtual memory space see and it was pro I, I forgot the number of the process now it was 17132 oh actually this one gives you a nice little pop-up so you can memory loop 17132 so it's okay now we asked we were map this one i think is the one we were playing with okay see we our address of where to put things in memory we use this address here Okay, and I think that's this one here. Okay, now this program doesn't update itself. This program, it it when you have to hit the refresh F5 key for it to change. So while while it shows you a snapshot of virtual memory, it doesn't keep updating itself. That's why I wrote that other program that will keep updating itself. So this one, you have to keep hitting the F5 key. For it to be updating and at some point see it's changed that was what that was this operation of alloc and then free and then it's going to change again see now it's gone because it, it got deallocated then there it appears again okay i'm hitting f5 see it changed shape i'm hitting f5 now it's gone There it came back again, but it's only looks like that. Then it changes. See, now it looks different. So you're we're seeing it do these steps here. Okay. Now this program, this is one reason I wrote for the homework assignment, a separate memory mapping program. This one, you have to keep hitting the F5 key to refresh it. You can't just have it just continuously refresh memory. So that's a bit of a disadvantage. But you can run these programs and you can watch physical memory. You can watch your virtual memory space change. We, are, one last thing, we're, if you think about this picture, we're seeing this side here. There are programs that you can run that let you watch this over here, but you have to run them in kernel mode. They're, they're, they're programs that are, you, they're not, they don't come with Windows. They let you watch physical memory, but they're, I've never used one. They're, they're real hard to run. They're used by people who write device drivers or people who actually program the operating system, the kernel. We, when, when we run a program like this, we're watching the virtual memory space of one program. 
and we don't we're not allowed to see what happens over here so we don't see the page table and we don't see over here we just see what's over here and that's what your homework assignment is is you're going to be manipulating the virtual memory space and you'll watch it change okay so we've run out of time so let me um end the meeting end the class if you have next week we'll talk about the policies of the swap space we're going to talk about the policy of the swap space and we'll be looking at those homework some of the problems that are in the review because those problems in the review are a good way of, of 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 reviewing and analyzing these ideas so we'll talk about some of the swap policies and we'll look at some of those review problems okay and if you have questions about the homework you know just please send me emails and and ask okay so i'm going to end the meeting now because we've run out of time bye